here's another way of thinking of it. You get injured, your brain is not designed to get you back to where you were before you were injured. It's designed to get you fun somewhere where you're functional. As long as you can run away from the line next time, good enough. If you're running with a limp, whatever. This is actually why certain forms of therapy like prolotherapy work is they're selectively re-injuring something to, you know, to do that next phase of healing that you didn't need to go through before. Hi everyone, Doug Adams here from Run DNA Podcast, and I am very excited for our guest today, Stephen Sashin. Many of you in the running world uh, and the walking world and just the activity world probably know of Stephen. If, if you don't, uh, at least his product, Zero Shoes. Stephen is the co-founder and CEO of Zero Shoes, and I was going to prepare an intro for Stephen, and then I listened to Guy Raz on how I built this, and you're the first person, Stephen, I've ever talked to that's been on how I built this, so oh. I feel a little bit of like big time and right now here for myself <laughs> because I'm talking to you here. Uh, but yeah, do I need uh, to, do I need to say something inappropriate to get you over that? No, no, not at all. I'm sure that'll come out at some point during this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's pretty much inevitable. Yeah, that's that's, that's guaranteed here. So yeah. we might have to put a little uh, viewer warning uh, on this one here, but the, it's going to be fun either way. So I, if if you don't know Stephen, I uh, it just it have gotten to be a great friend. Uh, I'll tell you maybe a little bit of how I've met Stephen and um, kind of my story. I like our story of how I met. Um, uh, yes. Do not include the nudity part. Yeah, yeah, that was that was the, yeah. yes, yeah, the moose on the hop, you know, bare bottom moose up the, up the mountain in Park City. Yeah, we'll stop there. Okay. But uh, so I was in Park City at uh, uh, the uh, Mountainland Running Summit, and we were there, mm -hmm. and we had moose right next to each other. And at the time, I literally there is a moose involved because I had a partially torn patellar tendon, and I went for a run the day before, and I got to the top of the mountain, and I had to sprint back down when the moose was up there having dinner. So I come back down and so we're standing all day and my knees start to ache and I'm like, you know what? Let me go talk. Let me try a pair of these on. I've never tried them on before. And instantly I went from having knee pain to not having knee pain standing there. And I was like, okay, <laughs> that's it. That I'm sold. I was like, can I buy these here now for the rest of the time? Like, I, I would like to wear these shoes for the rest of the, the conference here. Uh, and now fast forward, I just bought my entire staff zero shoes. We're going to sell them at Omega Project, my PT clinic. And it's just something that he's totally turned me into a believer. And I just think his passion and his commitment to the industry and really being a leader out there it's just something really admirable that that I have tremendous respect for Stephen and and what he's done with Zero Shoes and you should get to know Stephen more uh, during this podcast and the uh, how I built this and uh, get to know his shoes as well. Well, a thanks. B uh, one minor correction. Uh, I am yeah. co-founder with my wife and also co CEO at this moment. Co CEO. All right. Very so good. We are partners, which is delightful um, and best thing that's ever happened to me. I, you know, that's another thing I think uh, we have, we have lots of things in common, hair not being one of them. Uh, <laughs> My hair's pulled back right now, so people can't tell. It yeah. doesn't look quite as drastic of a change here for me, bald, and Stephen with beautiful locks there. But um, <laughs> one of the things that we really do have in common, I think, is just, uh, I know, I say I outpunted my coverage with my wife uh, by a long shot, and I am just so lucky to have a wife that is just completely understanding of who I am and what I do. and totally tolerates like everything about me and starting businesses and doing all that stuff. And you, it sounds like you have that partner in crime as well. And I think if, if you do nothing else in life, that's the thing to do. I lucked out uh, like there's no tomorrow. And <clears throat> I was thinking about this the other day, this is going to sound weird, but I was thinking uh, if I knew I was going to off myself because I had a terminal illness, mm -hmm. uh, what would I want to do on my last evening? And I, I've been thinking about this for a while. I didn't tell Lena mm -hmm. until a couple of days ago. I don't know why. Uh, I said, um, it's pretty simple. Uh, I know the meal that I want to have. Actually, I don't know mm -hmm. the meal that I want to have. I know the dessert I want to have. It's a chocolate mm -hmm. cake from a place in Denver called D-Bar. And okay. I become friendly with the owner because we've been going to this restaurant for 25 years, but I just finally met the owner and we have a mutual love of chocolate. And he told me that the icing on this cake costs more than a prime rib. On a slice of the cake costs really? more than a prime rib. It's He's using the best Madagascar Criollo, if any, it's a total chocolate geek. In, in fact, he's had people who wanted to possibly acquire his business or manage the business 
look at that and say, you have to stop using this kind of chocolate in the cake. He goes, no, this is what made this place famous. And so I'd have that. But the important part is I said, then after that, it's uh, you and me and our dog on the couch watching a TV show. And then the next morning or at the end of that, then we're done. Yeah. Because that's just, I could not be happier. I mean, I, I actually did say this to Lena. There's nothing that makes me happier than knowing I'm going home and you're going to be there. That's, you know, a lot of times I start my day with a run and I get like a hug and kiss from my wife. And I'm like, you know what? No matter what else happens today, it's a good, good day. day. Good day. That's that's all that really matters here. Yeah. So I had one of those days uh, after as not a good of a week uh, recently there, and it was like the world is fine. It's good. So it's a superpower. As I always say, as soon as I got married and I put this ring on my finger, I literally felt like I had superpowers. Dude, um, we're getting way uh, off whatever off topic. Yes, but when we got married, like literally, so it was a it was a kind of a multi part event in in a way, but. So between the actual ceremony and the reception, it was all in what in the same place. Um, but we had like an hour off, and I went up. We went upstairs to the room we were in, and I said, um, "This is going to sound weird, but I like feel like my body has changed." Yeah, I mean, I, there's like a literally different sensations in parts of my body than I've ever had before. And she looked at me like I was uh, crazy and said something like, "I love you too," and I had no idea what I was talking about. But I mean, it's. Um, it's a blast. And, and my favorite story, though, is my parents for my whole life kept saying, you know, we want you to marry a nice Jewish girl. And I used to say to my father, there's so many assumptions in there. I don't even know where to begin. Um, <laughs> so, you know, let's not go there. But uh, so I brought Lena home to meet my parents. And I said to my folks, what do you think about Lena being your daughter in law, even though she's not Jewish? And my parents said, look, we just see that in your previous relationships, you start out happy and you get less happy. And this one, you start out happy and you become more happy. And that's all we care about. And I made finger gun, you know, motions at them and said, okay, what'd you do with my real parents? Yeah. So, um, uh, it was, you know, it, it was great and, and they adore her and, or did. Um, and, um, yeah, no, I, I definitely lucked out. That's great. So yes, Stephen has many successes in his life, but I think that is one of the best ones from yeah. my own personal experience. Um, so I think that's, that's what you can do. So now I want to jump right in though okay. here, right? Um, audience is a lot of runners, a lot of physical therapists, athletic trainers, and I want to jump right into barefoot kind of stuff here. Um, okay. Well, yeah. me, can I, I'm going to start with a caveat. Because Go for it. Just by saying that, a lot of people are going to tune out or think that I'm, you know, some uh, something. Uh, I want to be clear. I'm not going to try and tell you that everyone needs to be barefoot or in a pair of zero shoes. Nope. Um, that is not the mission of what we're talking about here. What we're talking about is optimal human functioning. And there are going to be things that um, you will do that I may disagree with and I could not care less. But right. what you're going to find as we start the conversation is the points that are most important I think we'll all agree because they are so self-evident, so obvious, there's nothing to disagree with. And I'm going to give you, a, I'll give you a, the world's fastest teaser. And I love to ask it this way. Can you ever think of a time where weaker is better than stronger? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and other than, you know, if you have some imbalance, you need to make one part strong and one part weak to, you know, do whatever. Yeah. Or get something from being hypertonic to not. But fundamentally, you know, weaker is not better than stronger. So if we can agree on that, then we can take a look and see what things are you doing that might make you weaker versus stronger. And then, you know, you can decide what to do after that, but you need to have the information. You need to know the context to make this evaluation. And then you decide there are right. going to be situations where you want to do something that will make you weaker over time because it's giving you some other benefit that you can't sacrifice on. So I'll use the simplest example. If you're a serious rock climber, you're going to shove your feet into something that is way too small for your foot and squeeze your toes together and um, is necessary for the kind of climbing that you might be doing, knowing that you're making your feet miserable. And that's cool. You need that. If you're ice skating, ice skates are not great for your feet, um, but the way they're currently built, that's what you need to wear. But there are ways of still dealing with being strong, even if you're putting yourself somewhere. Look, if you want to wear high heels every now and then, horrible for you, but you can do it if you are actually strong enough to handle that. And so we can talk about, you know, that aspect of things. So, um, 
you know. That's perfect. Yes. And that leads in, I, I, that leads in perfectly to the first question I kind of prepared, but it also w it was something that a friend of mine mentioned at the gym today, exactly what you're saying. And he kind of put it in a different way. He says, pick your heart. Like, yeah. It's, you know, he was talking about somebody that it's hard to be out of shape and it's hard to be in shape, <laughs> but the, right, you know, you, you pick your heart and you say, it's hard to get in shape and stay in shape, but the benefits are great. Yeah. It's hard to be obese, overweight and deal with diabetes and cardiovascular disease, but like it's, you know, it's beneficial if you're really into, uh, you know, chocolate cake and, and watching movies you, you know, every night. Yeah. If you, if you use multiple pizzas as the bread for some other filling, yes. um, you know, yeah. 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 If that's, Pick if your that's heart. Your thing, yeah. If that's your thing. I get it. Yeah. If you want to hit the easy button on one thing, there's like, everything's possible. There's just consequences. So, yeah. Um, so my uh, first question I kind of prepared is, is along those lines of exactly what you just talked about. And I think a lot of people think that they know why barefoot shoes help. They talk about foot strength or they talk about mobility. But I've heard you talk before, and I might be leading you a little bit here, but can you talk about what barefoot, like why barefoot shoes really do help people? Like what's sure. the real reason that a barefoot shoe would be beneficial and why you'd advocate it for maybe not everyone, like you said, but for a large amount of the population would benefit from it? Well, no, I'd actually advocate for everyone under certain circumstances. Yeah. So now yeah. let's not pick the edge cases of someone who's got some significant deformity or, you know, fill in the blank where it really makes no sense. People love to do that. It's like, well, what if somebody, you know, has uh, whatever, metatarsalgia, whatever you can think of, something right. where you know, it's a foot split or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're in the they're way off the uh, off the bell curve. Let's yep. deal with you know that sixty seven percent of the bell curve, or frankly, mm -hmm. probably ninety percent of the bell curve. Yeah. So um, again, let's come back to the what's the word I'm looking for? The common sense part. Let's do and let's start with stronger and weaker. So weaker is not better than stronger. I'm going to ask a weird upside down question. If you want to make some part of your body weaker. How would you do that? You demobilize it. Yeah. So put your arm in a cast. What a shock. Your arm comes out weaker eight weeks later. It's yep. atrophied. You can't move it properly. You have two choices at that point. You put it in a sling and never use it again and let it stay weak. Or you do a little bit of exercising, you get the joints moving around, and then you can build up strength again. I'm having a blast. I had my left arm in a sling for quite a while after having a bunch of surgery, and it was annoying how much it atrophied. I'm having so much fun now that I can lift again, mm -hmm. watching things come back. Um, you know, the true definition of muscle memory is that those cells are ready to work again once you let them. So anyway, we know how to make something weak. Cool. Yeah. Well, I'm going to pull out a, um, I'm pulling out a prop, which is a kind of quote, normal shoe, which mm -hmm. doesn't bend. It barely bends in the toe in a spot that that's not where your foot actually bends everywhere else is super, super stiff. So you put your foot in something that doesn't let it bend and flex that squeezes your toes together. So they can't mm -hmm. move properly. So if you're squeezing your, especially that first ray, um, then you can't actually engage the longitudinal arch properly. So, yeah. every, and put in arch support. It's making things weaker because you're not using them. The research could not be more clear. Uh, Katrina Protopapas and others did this one. You put arch support in the shoes of healthy individuals and in up to, in less than 12 weeks, they lost up to 17% of the cross-sectional area of the intrinsic muscles in the foot and 70% of the muscle of the uh, strength in the foot as well just proving the point, put it in a cast, it gets weaker. Imagine what that does over time. It doesn't go to zero, of course, but it does get, you know, asymptotically close. Yeah. As weak as you can possibly get something while still be able to function. And you can get feet really weak and still be able to function mm -hmm. by putting on a big thick shoe and basically walking, shuffling and just, you know, slamming your heel into the ground over and over. And we'll come to cushioning in a moment. But anyway, so we know uh, that immobilizing the foot in various ways makes it weaker. There's also research from Sarah Ridge when she was at BYU showing that just walking in a minimalist shoe builds foot strength as much as doing a foot exercise program. And even though the exercise program only takes, you know, five, 10 minutes, you can do it while you're watching TV. We also know about compliance. Most people will never do that thing more than a couple of times. Yeah. So just walking in shoes like ours. And Sarah will say uh, you should get the same benefits from zero shoes as what they used in the study. Because when they did the study, I don't think we actually had more than one um, uh, actual closed toe shoe at the time. So they weren't hip to what we were doing then. Totally fine. Okay. Next piece of research. Uh, this comes from Isabel Sacco in Brazil, who's done some really cool research. We'll probably, I'm sure we're going to mention her again. She 
took, um, I think it was about 200 and something people in each cohort. One group just wore a regular shoe mm -hmm. uh, and the other group wore a regular shoe, but did a foot strengthening program. Same one Sarah Ridge was using fundamentally. Yep. It was an eight week strengthening program. And over the course of a year, the people who were again, running in regular running shoes, high heeled, motion controlled, arch support, whole thing, 250% lower injury rate in the people who did the exercise program. Now, again, I know about compliance. People mm -hmm. aren't going to do it, but let's do the math on what we just said. Walking in barefoot shoes gives you foot strength, just like doing the exercise program that is shown to reduce running related injuries by 250% over the course of the year long study. Right. So what does that mean? Run in whatever the hell you're comfortable running in. As long as you're not aching and painting and whatever else, run yep. whatever you want. As soon as you're done, get out of those and ideally just walk around barefoot, frankly. But if you yeah. need to you know, go out in public and you're not like me who does that barefoot often, then <laughs> Put on our shoes or boots or sandals. We got casual and performance stuff, you know, whole, like 55 different styles. Yeah. For active recovery. So you're getting everything moving. You're getting circulation going. Um, you're keeping the things from getting super tight. Um, and for building strength that will make you more resilient, even if you're still wearing Hoka on whatever, Nike, whatever yeah. you can think of. So, yeah. so let's just start there. But let me do, actually, let me do the next one because this is... Um, the second most important reason, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to do three and I'm going to do this one in the middle. Let's just start with the simplest thing. The number one thing people want when they put on a pair of shoes is something that feels good. Right. You want comfort. Now, granted, a whole bunch of cushioning can feel good. But as we know, if we go back to that, you know, pizza for bread thing, things that uh, sometimes feel good are not necessarily good for you. And cushioning, not good for you for two reasons. One, it's not letting your foot move. Mm-hmm. So now we're back to weakening you Two, yep. uh, actually a couple of reasons Two, it's high enough that you become tippy. Yes. Um, you know, the higher you get off the ground, the harder balance and agility become. Uh, if the shoe has a flared sole in particular, you catch the edge of that flared sole and you have just sprained or worse your ankle. Yeah. Uh, that's problematic. But the biggest thing that, that all that foam does is prevents you from using another part of your foot. The, mechanoreceptors, the sensory information you're getting on the soles of your feet. Over 200,000 nerve endings in the sole of each foot. Mm -hmm. They aren't there for no fucking reason. Yeah. So I like to ask people, why do you have all those nerves in your feet? Actually, I like to start by saying, which is better, numbness or feeling? Yeah. And they go, well, feeling. I go, cool. So you have all these nerves in the bottom of your feet to feel things. How much can you feel through a big, thick shoe? How much yeah. can you feel the ground right now? And they go, uh, nothing. Or yeah. very, very little. And if you're not getting that feedback, you're going to have issues, especially if you're on uneven terrain. You're not going to get information to your brain fast enough, if at all, to then respond accordingly, starting with your feet and ankles. Yeah. So, uh, so that becomes, a, frankly, a comfort thing, because if you if you have if you don't have all that cushioning, especially if you're not elevating your heel, which tips your center of mass forward. And then you have to adjust by leaning back somewhere from your ankles, your hips, your knees, your back, whichever is the weakest link is going to get the brunt of that stress. That's going to um, get all. Yeah. So getting rid of, uh, if you want comfort or what I call genuine natural comfort, you need to be able to feel the ground and respond to it. And I can get a little more specific about that too. Um, you also need to not squeeze your toes together. So mm -hmm. little shoes, they have pointy toe boxes for reasons that I have no explanation for. So a true barefoot shoe lets your toes spread. The first thing that we see when people put on our shoes, their eyes light up. It's like, oh my God, I, my toes are actually not all squished yeah, up. They're moving. And then I watch what happens when they put their regular shoe back on and they just look sad, Yeah, which is pretty entertaining. That was me in Park City here oh. when you, uh, when I, you were like, no, we don't have any shoes for sale. And I was like, come on, Stephen, <laughs> bring some of these pairs for me here. Help me out. Yeah, exactly. So, so the comfort thing is important, but that leads to the reason that you want to have something low to the ground for balance and agility, thin enough to give you protection. Uh, well, that combination of thin, thick enough to give you the right amount of protection and traction you need for whatever you're doing. So different if you're on a road versus on a trail, for example, we'll have a luggier sole on our trail shoes. Yep. Um, but also not lifting your heel up because that messes with your posture and puts strain on various things, including your plantar fascia, long story. Um, we can get into that if we have to. Uh, so that natural platform is comfortable for posture yep. and you're letting your you know body do what it's made to do. And what I can tell you is people will say, well, what if I'm standing on, you know, hardwood floor or cement all day? And um, I'm working with some guys who have some force plate type technology, put on our shoes and got on the force plate. 
And we're trying, they have a, it's a different kind of technology than just a regular force plate. They were trying to zero things out, just have a baseline. And they couldn't mm -hmm. quite zero it out. There was always just like a little wobble in the graph. And they were trying to figure out what was going on. And then they finally realized, oh my God, my feet are doing this subtle little adjustment, these little micro movements, yes. which is actually what they're supposed to do. And when you do that, standing all day on a hard whatever, totally, totally doable because you're giving your body exactly what it needs to g be genuinely naturally comfortable. It's the biggest thing that happens with every new employee. We yeah. take them to a trade show and they're terrified that yeah. something's going to hurt at the end of the day. And at the end of the day, they're like, uh, my back feels fine. My hips feel fine. My knees feel I'm fine. Good. Yeah. All of our warehouse workers in our shoes, on their feet, cement floor all day, every day, running around like crazy, not having problems. You know, I just heard um, a lot to unpack there. Lots of good things here. But I just heard a story about a baseball player that was kind of, and I don't have the name and I didn't fact check this. So apologies, like just a, a little note on it there. But he said that he was falling out of favor and about to be kind of thrown out of major league baseball. He wasn't playing as well. And what he started doing his training program was he took all the chairs out of his house and he, the only time he sits down is to eat. He's standing the rest of the time. And everyone says, well, standing's bad for you and sitting's bad for you. And, and my response to it was, is right along the lines of what you were just talking about with a force plate study. It's not necessarily, I bet you, if you watched him, it wasn't just the standing that helped. It was that he was probably changing positions because you can't stand in one position no. too long. It forces no, you. You can't stand. Look, you long. can't stand in one position at all. At all. You're yeah. always moving subtly. And this whole thing, sitting is the new smoking, also complete bullshit for the exact same reason. Um, Dan Lieberman's latest book, uh, Evolved. I can't remember. Mm -hmm. um, and Lieberman is the guy who kind of created this whole, partly created this whole barefoot movement when yep. he came out with an article in yep. Science or Nature, I don't remember which, uh, 15 years ago that was showing the difference between what happens if you're running barefoot or in shoes. And um, the first chapter of his book is debunking that sitting is the new whatever. Smoking. Because, smoking yep. because the places where they spend most of their time sitting or lying down, way more than what we do, but mm -hmm. they're not sitting on something that lets them not move. So wait, I'm going to show yeah. you the chair that I'm sitting on right now. Yeah. It's an unstable thing yes. called core 360. It's basically the barefoot shoes of chairs. Yes. And um, it's awesome. I've been looking for a chair actually like that. And I found one actually that you can like tuck your knees under so that you can like oh, kneel and yeah, they never, they never work. Yeah. This thing I love. In fact, um, you know, we give, we give advice to people when they get a pair of our shoes, like you might be using muscles and ligaments and tendons you haven't used very much or at all for a long time. So think of it like going to the gym after you've been injured, start yes. slow, listen to your body, build up slowly over time. So they sent me this chair and I called them the next day and I said, um, man, I sat on that yesterday. It was great. They said, what are you on it for? Like, you know, like we recommend for 10, 20 minutes. I went, no, 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 10 hours. They went, what? Yeah. I said, it was fine. It was totally yeah. fine. Yeah. So Cause you um, do movements and you, you're yeah. not sitting still that much. So exactly. all right, one other thing I want to unpack from what you said earlier here, because it's along the lines, and this is a question I get a ton. A lot of people ask me this. So like, what are my rules for picking shoes? Okay. Uh, well, what are yours? Mine are the first one is comfortable. The second one is lightweight. And most okay. people say that. And that's what the literature really supports, like the, selecting a shoe comfortable and lightweight. But the third one, and this is where I was kind of leading with this question is, it doesn't force you to move differently because you're wearing the shoe than what your natural movement pattern is. So I agree with you. But um, I spent some time with Dr. Bill Sands when he had a lab out mm -hmm. here in Colorado. He was the former head of biomechanics for the U.S. Olympic Committee. And what we saw and what happened when you worked with Bill, and I got to do that for a little bit in part because um, he did this crazy thing. Some of the Olympians that I trained with said, go out and spend a day with Bill because he does all this analysis and then gives you a whole program to do and it's $50. Like, I'm sorry, what? So me and a friend who's a world champion cross country runner got in the car and beelined our way to Western Colorado. And had way too much fun. So when you go into Bill's lab, he sticks you in a mission impossible harness and throws you on his giant treadmill, five feet wide, 10 feet long, goes up to like 30 miles an hour and has you run in your favorite shoes while he films you at 500 frames per second from the back and from the side. Mm -hmm. And I said, why 500? Because first of all, you need a lot of light for that and it gets pretty hot. And he said, um, you really can't see what you need to see at anything under 240. So mm -hmm. I go to 500 and quick tangent. He was right. Uh, I found that I had a 
some tightness in my right hamstring that right before ground contact, my right foot was everting about 20 degrees, which you wouldn't have, and you only saw it in the last two frames. So you yeah. saw it in, you know, two frames at 500 a second. If you had filmed at anything less, you could have possibly missed it. Well, so, I'll put one caveat from a biomechanics standpoint. You're right. And I'll put a little caveat on it. If you, with a typical recording time, if you record for longer time, yeah. then you're fine. Yeah. So, you'll eventually find it. Yeah. Right. You'll eventually find it. And the average will show it because right. it's going to get it there. So if you're able to do, if you do, if you only have 10 seconds of recording time, then yes, you need as much. But if you're going yeah. longer, then you well, can get a lot more. And, and so, you know, he's filming you doing what you do. So he's filming yes. you as a sprinter at that time, which is now 12 years ago, something like that. My top speed was 23 miles an hour. So yeah. I've only got that for four strides. So we yeah. have to be in from a fast. <laughs> We're fast, um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, but the, here's the more interesting thing. So you, you do your favorite shoe, then barefoot, mm -hmm. and you watch the changes, and 90% of the people immediately change to a very different gait pattern. That's mm -hmm. more optimal. We can get to that. Uh, the 10% who don't, mild bit of coaching, and then they do as well. But then he has you wear every other shoe that you possibly wear. That's the instruction. Bring in anything that you possibly walk or run in. Mm -hmm. And the amazing part to watch <clears throat> is that unless you are a highly trained sprinter or middle distance runner, anything up to the 800, definitely sometimes the mile, but not always. If you're anything other than those, your gait will change based on what shoe you put on your foot. And here's the kicker. You won't know it. Mm. So we even had a guy who was a, he called himself a habitual barefoot runner. He spent most of his time in five fingers when he was barefoot, his form looked perfect. When he put on the five fingers, which are barefoot, uh, he started overstriding and heel striking and didn't know he was doing it. Hmm. Now, quick caveat there. Um, at the Mountain Land Running Summit, one of the things, or not caveat, quick uh, tangent. When we were at the Mountain Land Running Summit, I was really happy that there was one point of agreement among everybody who was on the stage talking about uh, the cause and cure of injuries. They all said the same thing. Overstriding is the number one problem. And, you know, whether you're, and of course, the, mm, the what's the word i'm looking for corollary to that no there's something else for that i can't think it's a friday um <clears throat> overstriding is the number one problem if you overstride in plantar flex then you're really screwed overstriding and heel striking has other problems mostly sending force straight up into your joints which are not wired to even tell you that you're getting that force in those joints so you won't right. feel it till it's too late but i've seen people overstride in plantar flex like oh god uh, that's bad but fundamentally oh, yeah. overstriding biggest problem yeah so well why was i saying that um where are we going with that? Uh, well, and I, we, I was going to say, we oh. have four types of overstriders and things like that, that we typically say, like the overstriding, and you're saying the agreement with um, all the no, providers was that. No, no, but, yeah, no, but I want to back up. It, this had to do with, you know, like the comfort thing and the shoe yeah. that doesn't affect your motion. Yes. Almost every shoe for most people will affect your gait. So again, with the sprinters, with the 400 meter people, with the 800 meter people, with a few hundred milers, you can put bricks on their feet and nothing changed. And, yeah. a real, and frankly, a really, really good, well, I've actually seen this too with marathoners. I've watched some marathoners on a treadmill and like every stride looks the same for two and a half hours. It's amazing. But you put a different shoe on them and it changes. Now, every stride will be the same, but it changed from yeah. the other shoe. So backing up the, to the, you know, comfortable is the first thing. But of course, what most people think of as comfortable is a bunch of padding, a bunch of cushioning because... Right. Look, yeah, it feels good. Lying down feels good. Do it long enough and you can't stand up. Yeah. Yep. And that's why I think then the lightweight is the next part, right? Yeah. Because we know that that actually does affect your running economy and it puts increased energy demand. The, the yes. more, the heavier the shoe is. Yes. Um, and then the doesn't adversely affect your mechanics is the next thing there. And that's, um, so that's, yeah, that's where things get to be messy. So the lightweight yeah. part, frankly, from what I can tell, and I and I got this idea in large part from a guy named Jeffrey Gray, who has a company called Helux. They do yeah, Jeffrey. Yeah, yeah, Jeffrey's wonderful. Um, they analyze footwear, and Jeffrey and I were talking about uh, on my podcast. And by the way, I'm sick of everyone having a podcast. And if you want to hear more about that, listen to my podcast. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, Jeffrey and I, again, mostly Jeffrey. He's the one who planted the seed think that the reason, quote, super shoes are super for some people, mm -hmm. and the some people means if you're the right weight running at the right speed, which yeah. you probably aren't. Yep. Um, so ignoring that for a second, the reason they may be helpful, and I say may because there are still people setting PRs and winning races who aren't wearing those, 
But let's face the facts. If there's five of you who are the five fastest people in the world and one of you shows up wearing some new shoe and wins a race, guess what the other four people are doing tomorrow? So again, ignoring the peer pressure part. Because the shoes are lightweight, they aren't fundamentally changing your gait. Because they're so, because they're not changing your cadence, because they're not heavier, they yep. may require less energy to move your legs. Mm -hmm. But VO2 max, which is the proxy we use for efficiency, not a perfect proxy. People, you know, otherwise we would just line people up at the beginning of a race, check their VO2 max, and hand out medals. Right. Um, yeah, running right economy and VO2 max are very different things. There. Well, yeah. And and yes, they are. So, um, but that's, but what most, when most people say running economy, they're measuring yeah. two max. Yeah. So, uh, not changing your gait because of the lightweight, maybe improving things a little bit because of the lightweight, you're yeah. not spending as much energy over time. There's mm -hmm. data about that, but if they're high enough and your gait doesn't change, if your cadence doesn't change, you might be getting an extra inch per stride and speed is cadence times stride length. So yeah. that might be the reason people are slightly faster. Might be. It could be other things. Tim Noakes, his theory about the uh, central governor, that uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's true. They just haven't identified where your in your brain is designed to say, whoa, whoa stop that or you're going to get hurt. And it's a little paranoid. It's a little hypochondriacal. So it's often telling you to slow down when you can still keep going. When you put on a new pair of shoes that you think is going to make you faster, you might get those same messages, but just reframe them in some way. So there could be serious placebo effects. Oh, yeah. for this. Um, but what's crazy and you saw, I'm sure you saw it at the running event where we were both there in December. Mm -hmm. uh, now what people are doing is making these single use shoes that are even lighter and even higher. Yeah. They're literally designed for one race and they cost 450 to 500 bucks a fucking pair. Yeah. Um, they have no outsole. It's basically, they took a foam midsole and went, that's yeah. the shoe. Yep. So anyway, so the All this gives me good job security. <laughs> yeah, you and me both. So the so again the the problem with your your order of um, of uh, whatever the hell you said is that it's not it, those have to be looked at as kind of like a Venn diagram instead of something mm -hmm. in order because otherwise people yeah. get hung up on the comfort and go. But I like how these feel. Yes, yeah, it's not all weighted equally either, right? Because yeah. if I think you really have to check all three boxes, right, yeah. uh, to some level, like it has to be comfortable and it has to be lightweight and it can't affect your mechanics. Right. And if you can find a shoe that does that, then that's a good shoe for you, right? I would say I would say all of ours, but uh -huh. um, so let's be clear about another thing. In addition to talking about optimal human functioning, we're talking about form, not footwear. Yes. And so the question is, you know, does it affect your biomechanics? First of all, many people have crappy biomechanics to begin with, regardless of what they're running in. So, and then if that's true, just switching to a shoe like ours can help and does help many, many people just because of the feedback that you get where, look, if you're running barefoot, bad form feels bad, good form mm -hmm. feels good. Yes. Um, similar thing in ours, but it's a little bit muted because there's something between your bare feet and the ground. So it was really interesting. Uh, Nicholas Romanoff, the guy who created what he calls pose method, and I hate the word method because that's not a good description for what it is. Mm -hmm. He's really identified what your what position your body needs to be in for optimal running. And the question is, when are you getting into that position? You can get into it early or late. If you get into it late, you're non-optimal. If you're getting into it early, you're the first person ever to do that. So it's a, you know, when are you hitting these proper postures? And the best way I can say that to make it seem, you know, people that raises people's hackles, think about learning ballet, because this is where this whole idea came from, actually, yeah. part of the Soviet sports training world. In ballet, all those things you do, plies, releves, are not just for training there to teach your body what the proper movement is for the more advanced thing. A mm -hmm. plie is what you need to do to do a jeté properly. If you can't do the plie properly, you're going to screw up the jeté uh, split jump. So, um, you know, it's things like that. Running, there's the same kind of things. If you're mm -hmm. not doing certain things properly, you're not going to be in the right position where you need to be, which is frankly when you hit the ground, because that's yeah. the only time you're able to do anything of any import. So anyway, Nick came um, out and did a workshop uh, at our store. About 20 people showed up. And the first thing he does is kind of explain what's going on and explain this, what he refers to as the pose. And your job is just to do the pose, which is your on. I'm not going to describe it, but suffice it to say. Figure four. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of figure, figure four, four on one foot, heel slightly off the ground. Yeah. Um, and you just want to go from that pose when your right foot is on the ground to that pose when your left foot is on the ground. Mm -hmm. That's all you're trying to do. And there's a little more to it, but that's the gist. Yeah. Anyway. A um, bunch of people who've been wearing our shoes 
and often having a great experience for months or years, but then something started to creep in or sometimes they switched to our shoes and still there was a little thing that hadn't worked its way out better than before, but still a little something. And then he videotapes us, you know, running across uh, in super slow-mo. I mean, we're not running in slow-mo. He's filming in super slow-mo and every one of them is slightly overstriding. And then we do a bunch of drills to get them to go from, you know, pose to pose to pose uh, and then run again. And they ran again, felt totally different, videotape them, looking at them, they're not overstriding. Now, you do something similar with the cues that you give after you do gait analysis um, that are very similar cues to the same thing that Romanoff does. And I, you know, got into a fun argument with them about that because it was fun. And because the thing with any running cue, any movement cue, right time, right person is the, you know, right cue, right time, right person. And right. so another, another Venn diagram. So some cues work perfectly for some people and not others and vice versa. Um, yeah, it's got to make sense to the runner. Yeah. But again, the, the key is it's about the form, not the footwear. The footwear mm -hmm. will inform the form. Might take you all the way there. Might take you 90% of the way there. But then yes. one of the reasons that I adore you, other than the fact that I adore you, is that what you put together is not only a brilliant piece of technology, but you understand what to do with the information you're getting to help change what people are doing if they're not getting enough information to do it naturally. And yeah. that is, you know, and one of the reasons that I hate you with a white hot passion is that <laughs> I'm good at some of those things too. And you came up with some things that I never thought of, which just annoys me. So, uh, and I'm putting, well, I think that's a big compliment. So thank you. I, yeah. I <laughs> air quotes around all of those. I couldn't yeah. be happier um, because frankly, there's not a lot of people who think through this stuff really, really well in our world. And to meet someone else who's done it and, you know, done parts of it better than me makes me extraordinarily happy because then I don't have to do it. I don't have to try and figure that stuff out. You already did it. I can just say, uh, here's this thing that Doug's figured out. Go talk to him. And then, you know, it's off my plate. Well, this conversation is evolved, not just the compliments at the end, but everything even before that has evolved exactly the way that I was hoping. Because, <laughs> uh, uh, damn it. I, I did was, something wrong then. Yeah, no, you did it exactly yeah. what I was hoping. My, my leading question kind of figured out and it just like – kind of summation a little bit and maybe oversimplification. So correct me if you disagree with it here. But when I asked the question, you know, what is the real benefit of barefoot shoes? And we did start to talk a little bit about strength and we did, you know, there's mobility and things like that. But I don't view that as really the, the main benefit. Those are secondary additional benefits of, of what the shoes are. Okay. Um, and that's what most people are going to say. But exactly what we were just talking about is the way I use these shoes. I use it to inform movement. I use it to break down movements. When we run, there are different phases of running. And yeah. we need to be able to say, hey, what am I doing in the um, swing phase? What am I doing in the stance phase? What am I doing here? And the whole thing is that when you have a barefoot shoe, you are promoting more feedback about form. Correct. And we are allowing people to understand what their body is doing, which is one of the biggest challenges. There's a study that everyone quotes that you ask runners, they ask like master and collegiate runners, hey, what's your, do you land on your heel or do you land on your toes? And more than half of the people were wrong, right? So we don't know what we're doing. We need to know. And that's what I see the yeah. real benefit of like the zero shoes are is it lets people understand the consequences of their movement pattern. So... Um, most people use the word proprioception wrong. Proprioception is actually just knowing the position of your joints in space. Fundament that doesn't mean you're in the air, but just, you know, what the joint position is mm -hmm. in space. Harder to, and I don't mean, you know, like space, space, Yeah. You know, even though Lane and I are- Three-dimensional space, yeah. We, we, Lane and I are in season four of For All Mankind, which is all about <laughs> space, but regardless. Um, I see it all the time. Look, when I was a young gymnast, uh, and those are two related things, um, but when I was young and a gymnast, in the compulsory Florex routine, we had to learn to put our arms parallel to the ground. And it took us weeks as 12 year old kids to learn what parallel was because the way it looks to your eye is different than reality. And so most people have mediocre at best proprioceptive skills. And so they won't know if their heel striking, for example. Yeah. And, um, classic story, I had someone <clears throat> send me a picture saying there's something wrong with the rubber in your shoes and he shows the sole and it's you know, worn out on the um, lateral heel. And I said, oh, you're overstriding and heel striking. And he said, uh, no, I don't think so. I'm, I'm a teacher of natural movement running. I went, okay, uh, send me a video. And he sends me a video and I had to, now, first of all, before I could get him on to look at the video together, there was a problem with my, my video player and all I could hear was the audio and I could hear it slap, 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 mm -hmm. slap. I could hear it. 
anyway, I get that fixed. I get him on the, on zoom with me and I show him frame by frame, you know, when you're landing, your ankle is way in front of your knee. And yeah. so, the, and your, your dorsiflexed, I mean, it's pretty obvious and it took him 20 minutes of me drawing on the screen until he finally went, okay, I see that. And his next line, I swear to God was, yeah, but I don't do that. <laughs> it's like, we're, we're looking at you doing it right yeah. now. You yeah. sent me the video of you. So, and that's happened quite a bit. So the only two ways that you change that is with some sort of internal or external feedback. The internal can be what you're just feeling, whether you're barefoot yep. or in shoes. Um, there, or the external could be video or some variation of video, which is what you're doing, or other forms of biofeedback. If you had, like if you were wearing a, a knee brace that had mm -hmm. uh, sensors in there, you know, and just measuring, you know, giving you EMG data, you need yeah. some sort of data. Like um, the gymnast thing, we needed people telling us. We needed mm -hmm. someone acting like a camera. You show someone on camera, let alone with all the joint positions and all the stuff you do with your gait analysis, mm -hmm. uh, you show them and I'm going to say it's hard for them to argue, not impossible. They'll argue, but you know, this is the thing that the only way you develop better proprioceptive skills is with external feedback of some, or a combination of internal and external feedback. So like the, when Nick Romanoff came, um, when he videotaped me, I think it was two years ago, but maybe three, I can't remember. He happened to be in town. And, um, what he showed me to understand what I was doing was a video of Usain Bolt running in super slow-mo. Mm -hmm. It didn't have to be Usain. It could have been the other seven guys in that race. They all have the exact same form. But suffice it to say, he's saying, showing when his foot hits the ground, the initial ground contact, look at all the joint angles, look at the position of everything, um, and then look at where he is prior to that foot coming off the ground. Mm -hmm. And then he looked at me and he says, so when your foot's hitting the ground, it takes you three frames. I don't remember what speed we we're looking at and what frame rate of the video. It takes you three frames to get where Bolt is when he lands. Okay. So you're yep. three frames behind. I said to him, and this is going to be another compliment for you. I, so be, be prepared. I said to him, so how do I fix that? And he said, it's about awareness. And I said, that's not good enough. And he said, what? I said, I'm really aware of what my body does. I'm a former yeah. all American gymnast. I did crazy, crazy things. I know where my body is and I've been working on this because I could tell something felt off, but I couldn't figure it out. Anyway, cut to whatever, two or three years later when he's about to do this event and we're having dinner the night before and he goes, have you fixed it? I said, I don't know, but I think it might have fixed itself because of this cue that Doug Adams gave me. And the cue is when your foot's coming off the ground, Think about kneeing a soccer ball towards me while I'm standing in front of you. And all I can tell you, I said to Nick, is that that feels like it changed my running completely. Because a month later, when we were at the running event, and I'm running to get back to my booth for something, I felt like I was flying across the ground instead of pushing across the ground. Yes. And so when we're there doing this class and he videotapes everybody and they're overstriding, there was one guy who wasn't. This guy. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I don't look anything like Usain Bolt because he's a foot taller than I am. So, you know, it, it was really, really satisfying. And again, right cue at the right time. The cue that they have, I can work with it. It's actually an interesting cue, especially for walking. And the cue is you want to pull your foot off the ground into that figure four position as quickly as you can. And for walking, that's a very interesting thing to do. Because mm -hmm. if you do that while relaxing your ankle, you also, the way you get there is by quickly releasing your hip. So your hip flexor kind of releases, sounds weird. So when you're in the stance phase and you're starting to go, you know, if your right foot's the one that's planted, your left foot is swinging before you, your left foot hits the ground. There's a little bit of tension in that right hip flexor to pull your foot off the ground. The hip flexor kind of snaps and then relaxes. Yeah. And it's really, really cool. And I had a movement class when I was an actor for 35, 40 years ago. It was all about learning to move without your own personality in it. And they kept saying, release your hip to walk. And I had no idea what that meant until about a year ago when I figured that out by walking uphill and figuring out this weird way to walk uphill by you just using stretch for stretch reflexes in your hip flexor. So anyway, all the that said, is so cool with that. Just like how it uses bioarticulate muscles and passive structures. And it's like you do, I, that's the thing, what you're all talking about with the form and the cues, it's all about just letting somebody experience what that's like and then can they replicate it? The, prob I, the, yeah. the biggest problem we have as human beings is our brain's fundamental, one of its fundamental purposes is to make you think that's okay. 
And yeah. so we habituate to things that aren't good for us. Um, we diminish things that are bad for us. It's like, yeah, it's, yeah, I guess that's not, you know, it feels a little weird, but yeah, it'll be fine. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, but I mean, my God, you've seen people, it's like they have one leg that practically is falling off after a car accident. I'll, I'll walk it off. No, yeah. no, you literally walk it off if you stand up. Yeah. So it's, it's just a weird thing that brains do because otherwise, look, the way we use the part of our brain that's telling us when things are really bad is incorrectly. We use yeah. it to look in the mirror and go, I don't like the way that looks because way back when we didn't develop the skill of looking at a glass of water and determining whether it would kill us to drink it. So we just got really good at paying exquisite attention to what happened after we drink the glass of water. And now that everything's fundamentally safe, we just look at our, or feel our body and go, yeah, this is not good. Yeah. Well, one of our greatest strengths is actually our greatest weaknesses at the same point. And this is, it reminds me of, I took this like personality test one time for like a executive, like a coach kind of thing one time. And they talked about things that you do really well that actually when done too much can be weaknesses and, and can go badly. Um, and it was really, why are you looking at me when you say that? Yes, no, it, it was very eye opening for me. Um, and it helped me understand how I work with people better. But the, the same thing with our body, we have this coping mechanism yeah. where we can adapt instantly. So there's a term stiffness. Um, and when you're running, you have a preferred stiffness and think of it like how springy you are. And if you're very stiff, you won't go through much motion. If you're not very stiff, you'll go through a lot of motion. So we can adapt this almost instantly yeah. to what we're running on and surface wise and things like, which is really cool. If you can feel the surface. If you can feel it. Yep. And you need like the vibration and the proprioception yeah. and the foot. And, you know, we could do a whole dive into that, but um, that might be for another time. But I, our abil our inability to know when to stop compensating is <laughs> some of the weakness there that I think we have where we just say our brain is also very short-term thinking. It thinks when, I can do this right now. I don't enough. know that you're going to run 26 no, miles it, right it, now. Here's, here's another way of thinking of it. You get injured. Your, your brain is not designed to get you back to where you were before you were injured. It's designed to get you fun somewhere where you're functional. Good enough. Yep. Good enough. As long as you can run away from the line next time, good enough. If you're running with a limp, whatever. Yeah. So, you know, this is the, this is the one of the, this is actually why certain forms of therapy like prolotherapy work is they're selectively re-injuring something to, you know, to do that next phase of healing that you didn't need to go through before. Yeah. It's, it's all about adapt adaptation yeah. and it's all just about our ability to, to go from one thing to the next. And this is why I'm a huge advocate of, we need to be looking at gate all the time. Yeah. Right. I, I love your story about Nick, uh, you know, and, and looking at that in like three years later in my dream world that, you know, that's three weeks later, you right. know, where you're getting your form checked out and you're getting a gate analysis on a consistent enough basis because your form can change that quick too. It's true. I actually did uh, some force plate work today and uh, I mm -hmm. got a very compromised spine and it was fascinating. Bilaterally, I was like really even. Everything was great. Unilaterally, it's like, oh, my right leg is, you know, 10 percent different than my left leg because mm -hmm. uh, my sciatic nerve on both sides is pretty crushed. And on, but worse on the right. It's like, well, not a surprise. But the surprise yeah. was like, like, oh, when I'm bilateral, there's some compensation somewhere to allow things to be even because that's what I need to do when I'm running. So, yep. but I'm so, if I'm doing some weird little thing like single leg jumps, it's like, you know, my right leg's not quite as strong as my left leg. Yeah. Cause uh, nerves are all messed up. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, it's, it's very cool. Uh, we could, we geek out about a lot of this stuff here. I'm, I'm glad that we spent 48 minutes on my first question here. And, uh, <laughs> I had, uh, <laughs> I had about five or six prepared here. So I'm, I would do one. Here, do, here, we can do a speed round. Speed round. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right. Let's, let's do a speed round of this. Um, what's the future of shoe wear? Uh, I'm hoping it's going to be back to doing things that are letting human feet work the way human feet are supposed to work. We're dealing with a bunch of pro athletes who obviously, if they see there's a potential performance benefit, they're going to want to try it. And we're seeing the whole barefoot thing really start to take off in the training rooms. Um, mm -hmm. I talked to an NFL guy the other day. He said, you gave me three extra years of my career when I switched to your shoes. Great. So I'm hoping, and, and I know that the big companies uh, have said in the past they can't do this because it would be admitting they've been lying for 50 years. But I know they're at the point of recognizing there's something going on. So uh, I'm hoping it's you know sanity coming back into footwear. Semi along the same lines, like I kids and kids. shoes and things like that. Like yeah. 
starting, you know, because I think that this was one of my other credit questions too, where I said, you know, what if somebody has used these types of shoes, these other types of shoes for long enough that natural doesn't feel that way anymore? Well, it feels unnatural. Yeah, that's just that's just a question of acclimating. It's just a little bit of time. Yeah. It'll feel weird for a little while. Like, look, if you've been wearing a, a shoe with a highly elevated heel, when yeah. you get out of that, it'll feel like you're falling over backwards. Yep. Um, but you're not. If you look and you have someone show you video, you're going to see that you're actually standing straight for the first time. Yeah. The slope of the curve to get to the desired posture and positioning just gets a little shallower the longer you've been away from. Um, I don't know that it's a function of time. Um, it's a function of a couple things, but you know, some there's a everyone has a bit of has a different. Mm, facility for neuroplasticity. Mm -hmm. and so if you're more facile at feeling those things, having some more proprioceptive skills, et cetera, that'll make you faster. Like for me, I'm really good at that kind of at new movement patterns. Yeah. Um, it's a weird thing I've had since I was a kid. I mean, um, I did research on cognitive aspects of motor, motor skill acquisition and uh, I learned to tap dance pretty well in like two months. So, um, uh, but anyway, it, it's, it, time is not the only factor. There are other factors that will affect how long it takes for you to make that change until doing it. Um, uh, this is a weird thing. I had a sprinting coach who said the whole point of doing drills is to do them till you can't do them wrong and then do them in, do them till you can only do it right. And then do them till you can't do it wrong. Yes. That's a great way to do it. Yeah. It's just, and they've debunked that whole, it's 10,000 hours kind of yeah, thing. It's 10, like, hour thing is complete nonsense. Look, two yeah. things, when I first heard that, so I'm a sprinter and I'm a former gymnast, no yeah. sprinter or gymnast has ever put 10,000 hours into anything. And the third thing that contradicts it is the kind of person that it takes to do 10,000 hours, they came out of the womb that way. Yeah. They have some serious, you know, external motivation, but you can't just put in 10,000 hours uh, you know, well, that's I mean, that works. whole study, I think in the book Talent Code, they talked about this, right? right? Where there were some people that took 2,000 hours right. and there's some, some people that took 22,000 hours. So they said, oh, the average is 10,000 hours. But it's like, I want to know what that 2,000 hours is doing. Malcolm, and, yeah. let's just say this. Malcolm Gladwell is great at hindsight bias and oversimplification to create a meme that sells a lot of books. He's a very <laughs> smart guy. But um, I look forward to someday saying that to his face, in part because he's a 400 meter guy. And I want to talk about that, too. Oh, nice. All right. So that was going to be my next one. You're training. We talked about this a little bit before we got on. Yeah. You want a 100 meter all American time here. What's your like, what's the secret sauce? Like, what are you doing that's going to get you there? What's your key training thing? Well, um, so I, I have hit all American times in the indoor 60 yeah. Uh, for the last 15 years. So for men in my age group, which is now 60, 64, I'm hitting all American time. I'd like to hit the all American time for an age group behind me. And I was pretty close. So I'm pretty sure I could do that. But um, the fact that I haven't hit one in the hundred means I got a problem with the second half of my race. Mm -hmm. The problem has been that um, that little form glitch that I have is slowing me down. Yeah. And I've got, I'm spending too much time on the ground. I'm too much breaking. Most, a uh, little bit of braking, but mostly just the amount of time that it takes till I get into the right position for the proper takeoff, which yeah. is a little improper as well. Uh, that's, you know, that's the big glitch. So I'm really looking. And uh, some of it is also going to be training for both strength and power. So mm -hmm. at this age in particular, uh, I've gotten, I'm weaker than I was 10 years ago, obviously. I'm, my top end speed is not 23 miles an hour anymore. It's about 21. But yeah. um that's a big difference. And so what I can tell you, like my friend, Alan Tissenbaum, who's got the American and or world record and pretty much um, anywhere you can think of for the, the 50, 55, 60 and the hundred, his top end speed is through the roof. So yeah. that's always the secret in sprints is maximizing top end speed. Some hmm. of that's strength, some of that's form, some of that is power. And I'm, uh, I've had a bunch of, you know, um, I had a bunch of surgeries in the last year and a half. Um, and so I'm now just starting to get back into the gym and working on all that. Uh, so it's that combination of that cue you gave me that definitely changed my running, what I'm doing on the power side to just, you know, get back as much as I can before I start losing it. Um, and uh, just time on the track. I mean, the only way you get faster is by running faster. The way you run faster is doing it right. I love the multiple approaches, right? It's got to be strength and form and fitness kind of thing. Yeah. Jumping. Do you do much jumping? I do a lot of jumping. Um, and uh, that's one of the things that makes me saddest in the world. 
I used yeah. to have an 11 and a half foot standing broad jump. Um, I'm too ashamed to, you know, measure it now. I think it's around nine, nine and a half now, but it used to be, you know, 11 and a half. Yeah. And so there's things that I do that are nutty. I mean, I, you know, I'll do box jumps onto a 40 inch box um, and I'm five, four and a half. So that looks pretty crazy. But um, yeah, a lot of jumping, um, a lot of unilateral stuff. So I'll do, mm. I'll do like, I'll set up for a Bulgarian split squat and just do single leg jumps. Yeah. Um, so rear foot elevated single leg jumps. Oh man, they suck. But the next day, you know, that was a really good idea. Oh um, yeah. Um, Nordic hamstring curls. I'm happy to say I can go all the way down, all the way back multiple times. Um, quick piece of advice for people working on that exercise is I was trying to do like three sets of eight, three times a week for a while. And I just wasn't progressing. And mm -hmm. Then I went to five sets of five with about two minutes rest in between once a week within a month. So, uh, I'm just having a very different reaction to what it's taking to build strength at this age than when I was a kid. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. obvious, but it takes a while to figure it out. Yeah. I'm figuring out how to deal with the diagnosis of OLD right now here. It's, it's, the, it's the, pretty hard. The first uh, thing that I had to do was learn that when I'm on the track and I think, oh, let's do one more, that's the time to leave. Yeah. That's a good, that's a good yeah. lesson there for sure. That took a while. Um, all right. One more question okay. um, because I, I'm yeah, yeah. going to have yeah. you back because there's tons we could talk about, but if you'll come back, but um, I, this is more on the personal side of things, actually. So you've had a pretty, after listening to that and prep for this, you've had a pretty unconventional pathway to creating a, a really big brand and something that's, that's exceeded a lot of what it's not a small business, right? Let's no. just say you've, you've grown, you've done this there. So, you know, what's, I will self, uh, self motivating factors for asking you this question, but you know, what's one piece of advice you give any entrepreneur looking to build something bigger like this, like, because to go where you, it takes a lot of dedication, you're going to hit so many hurdles along the way. Every like, day. Yeah. What, what's the advice? What, what one thing would you tell somebody that's like, you want to build a big brand, you want to do something big, here's what you need to adopt? Uh, I don't know if I can actually answer that because my typical advice, there's two pieces of advice that I give for entrepreneurs at different stages. If they're thinking about it, my answer is uh, the best advice I can give you is get a government job with a pension instead. Yeah. And because I mean, I'm completely legit and serious when I say that. Um, if, if you could have talked me into that when I was 25, 2025, 20, my life would have been so much easier. Um, I would have had things like, um, what are they called? Uh, vacation, vacation, vaca vaca vacation. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's it. We had yeah. um, benefits, benefits. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Health, healthcare, I yeah. think it is. Yeah. yeah. Um, so because when I say that to people, if it gives you any pause, get a government job with a pension. If yeah. you're a true entrepreneur, there's nothing that I can say that will talk you out of your statistically stupid idea. Yeah. And I say that talking about myself too. I've had so many things that, you know, didn't pan out. Um, but I've lucked out. I've had, you know, just a couple that did really well and allowed me to live by doing things I was interested in. The second piece of advice, if you've already gotten, if you're in the process of getting started, uh, prove it first. I don't care what mm -hmm. you think about your idea. I, don't, I really don't care what you think about your idea. I, yeah. I care less about what you're, or a little less, whatever, then about what your friends and family think of your idea. Um, you got to get strangers to take their hard earned money out of their pocket and give it to you. And then you have to figure out how many of those strangers exist in the world and don't exaggerate. Don't say there's like 200 million people. And I've only got 1% of that. You're an idiot. Don't do that. Yeah. Um, so the way it used to be done is you put a full page ad in a magazine. People had to clip a coupon and send it to you with their money. And you wouldn't even have the product at that point. You would just see if you got enough money to justify making the product. Or running the ad again differently until you could see, is this going to work or not based on the response that I got? You can still do some similar things with AdWords and a simple landing page, for example. Oh, yeah. If you're an existing entrepreneur, um, what I say about the way we've gotten to where we are is it's 90% luck and the other 10% is also luck. And then <laughs> there's a separate 100% that is working your ass off every day. And the other 10% is hopefully being smart enough or knowing how to find people smart enough to put out the fires that started overnight, despite the fact that nothing changed since yesterday. Now, there's a caveat to that. It's best if you can, A, tell the truth, mm -hmm. no hype needed, and B, change people's lives. This is something that a friend of mine who's a very successful author, therapist, writer, occasional TV personality said the way you make millions of dollars is you find something that improves people's lives demonstrably 
and you ask them for a little money in exchange for it. And what has kept us going through all the literally daily difficult times. I mean, some days you walk home and, you know, it was a good day all around. Yeah. And then you know, tomorrow's going to suck. Um, yep. uh, but what's kept us going is from day one, the people who said, oh my God, these things changed my life. The yeah. reason we have 55, 56 different styles is people would say, oh my God, I love this shoe, but now I need something for the following use case. And so yeah. we make that, I mean, not always, but often. And so, um, and I say this to copywriters, you know, almost all ad copy is here's a better version of something you already understand. And you got to convince people that your thing is a better mousetrap when most likely it's probably not any better. And more often the original mousetrap didn't work either. So there is that. But if you can tell the truth, like I was featured in a, uh, a, a course on copywriting about, and my ch chapter that I was in was about telling the truth. I was promoting a nutritional product at that time. And the mm -hmm. opening paragraph was like, if anyone tells you this is going to change your life, they're lying to you. That's yeah. not what this product does. This is a foundational supplement. And if you understand what it does and that makes sense to you, try it. By the way, it's got a money back guarantee. And it was an antioxidant. I stopped yeah. selling it for a number of reasons, not the least of which being finding out that taking a bunch of antioxidants is bad for you if you're trying to improve performance and muscle because you need that stress, that oxidative stress to signal your body to fix things. And if there's already, you know, a bunch of antioxidants floating around your body, you're muting that effect. Amen. So stop doing that. But literally day one, you changed our lives. Um, last week, I'm in Costco. A friend of mine in California who lives in our shoes texted me. I bumped into somebody in a park. Couldn't stop talking about how you changed his life. And I had to text back saying, sorry, it took me two hours to get back to you. When I was in Costco and your text came in, I was in the middle of being stopped by a woman who spent an hour telling me how we changed her life. And... Um, I could not be more grateful about that. I don't take any of this personally. This is going to sound weird. Mm -hmm. the, I feel like um, I'm a guy who was walking down a New York City street by a big building and someone yelled baby. And I accident, you know, reflexively put my arms out and caught a baby. And I just happened to, for whatever reason, be the guy in that place who had the right whatever to catch the baby. And my wife is the same way. And a bunch of other people here are the same way. So, um, um, I, I think that's another part of it is from, well, for me, there's one other component, uh, this is going to sound weird. One thing you need to be attentive to, to make things have the best chance of making these work is to, to know when the right decision is to pull the plug. Yeah. It's really easy to be committed and think you're doing the right thing, but you got to have somebody who knows nothing about what you do. Look at the numbers and say to you this ain't going to work. And you have to live. Now I've had people saying that to me for years about everything I've ever done. Cause I'm usually a bit ahead of the curve. Um, I can't tell you how I knew they were wrong other than I knew they were wrong. I knew they weren't looking at the world the right way. Yeah. More important thing is I had people proving it to me every day by giving me their money, by telling me that it worked by saying that it changed their life. Now, sometimes, you know, I had to spend a hundred thousand dollars to get there uh, and prove it, but I, did. I mean, the, the yeah. day, like I had a software company, the day my product launched, I had people calling saying, Oh my God, this changed my life. If other companies aren't hearing that, I know I'm okay. I know I can make it work. Now, actually, I'm going to throw one other thing to pay attention to because, because look, your success, whatever you define that, the majority of it has nothing to do with you. Mm -hmm. So if a certain person gets elected in the upcoming election and does what they've said about raising import tariffs, it could put a lot of people out of business or make doing business very, very hard. You'd no control about that. The last time it happened uh, during the trade war, we had product that we'd already paid for that suddenly we had to pay an extra half a million dollars for because mm. suddenly there was a new tax that didn't exist two days earlier. Yeah. So you got to pay attention to the outside world and see what it's telling you. You got to pay attention to your competition, you know, because they're going to do things that you will never have thought of if you're threatening their livelihood. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So. Well, I really like this. The honesty part, I think, is really great to hear. And the honesty about your product externally and the honesty internally to yourself, too. That if you really do have something that can change lives and change the world, can you state it without overstating it? And can you just can you, you know, take can a, you, can you, yeah. Yeah. you know, here, here's a weird version of this uh, just occurred to me. I have people who hit me up every day for something they think is going to make my business better. And the question that I ask them is how quickly and cheaply can I find out if you have your head up your butt? 
Yeah. And they're like, what? I said, well, the only thing I can manage is risk. So yeah. I want to know how much money it's going to cost me to find out if you're right or wrong. Because you can't guarantee that you're right. If you could, you'd put your money where your mouth is and guarantee it. And if you're not going to guarantee it, I have to work on the assumption that it won't work for me. And I have to decide, do I want to spend that amount of money to find out if I'm wrong? I'm happy to be wrong yeah. um, in, in, you know, about whether it doesn't work. But I can't bank on it being on you, know, you telling me that it's right. That's great. Well, I'm glad luck was smiling upon you that you were willing to work hard and <laughs> you, have, you know, another person, you know, I wear your shoes every day. So, um, appreciate it. And thank you for everything you've done. And thank you for being on the podcast. This has been great. Oh, um, you know, I think we'll, we'll definitely have to have you back. We could go on lots of tangents, just have fun. Uh, but I appreciate you being here. Thanks Doug. It's a total treat. All right. Thanks everybody for listening and happy running. Like what you hear? Leave a review of the show wherever you listen, and don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an episode. Run DNA helps runners and running specialists through education and technology to identify each runner's unique injury profile to avoid setbacks and maximize results. The Run DNA podcast is produced by Ace Running LLC. The Run DNA podcast is intended for educational purposes only. No clinical decision making should be based solely on one source. While care is taken to ensure accuracy, factual errors can occur. Always seek the guidance of qualified medical professionals before making healthcare decisions. Find us online at rundna.com.